Beverly Diamondstein. Welcome to Visions and Images, American Photographers on Photography. Today we'll be talking to Dwayne Michaels. Dwayne Michaels, the modern master of the photographic narrative, uses his camera not as a tool for capturing moments out of the real world, but as an instrument for revealing his inner state. In telling stories with pictures, he is known as the creator of mysterious, and sometimes bizarre sequences, groups of structured photographs that embody a narrative progression. We're very pleased that you could be here today, Duane. You describe yourself as having come to photography late in life. When and how did you shift careers and decide that you were a photographer? I was never an amateur in the sense that I didn't want to grow up to become Cartier-Bresson, and uh, I was about 26, I think, when I went to Russia. I had been working as a designer, and as a result of that trip, I decided to become a photographer. I was pushing 30 when I made the fatal jump. And how did you do that? Well, I, I thought, look, if you want to be a photographer, why aren't you? And I had nobody, I, mean, I had no real answer for that. And I decided if I didn't have the courage to do it at 30, I sure as hell wouldn't have the courage to do it at 40, so I better do it right now. And as what were you working when you made that decision? Well, I was, I had been a graphic designer, uh, a mediocre, no, I wasn't mediocre. I was better than that, but... Uh, you were good enough to work for some leading magazines. Yes, yes, but uh, what well, that, that doesn't guarantee anything. At any rate, uh, what happened was the, uh, uh, I went to a small studio which went out of business, probably because of me. And uh, it seemed an appropriate time to uh, try something new. And I did. And I'm glad. What did you do in that Russian trip, during the course of that Russian trip, that led you to believe that photography was the medium in which you could best express yourself? Well, I went essentially as a tourist, and I borrowed a camera, and I, I didn't even have a light meter, and I sort of guessed everything. Uh, probably if I had thought of myself as a photographer, I would have been too self-conscious, and the photographs would have been really bad. Luckily, I just wanted to take nice pictures of Russians standing there the way my mother would point me in front of a camera, and uh, uh, that's how it started. I mean, they were good, and I knew that. And your first pictures are what you have described as history, the real world. Yeah, well, um, real to me is a very relative word. Even world is a relative word. <laughs> Relative to what? Relative to uh, what most people think it is. Uh, I don't. I probably don't view it the same way most people view it. So consequently, my photographs don't really look the same way that most photographers' work look. Well, at some point, you became disillusioned what many, with what many of us do call the real world or history, and you had the idea of working with serial images. Mm -hmm. How did that originate, and how did that evolve? Well, essentially came out of need for something to be expressed, and I realized that things that interested me weren't things that I would find on the street, and I would have to go out and make them happen myself. I was never a reportage person. I never, even today, I don't walk around with a camera hoping to find a wonderful accident. Uh, so it became, it came out of the need to talk about things that really disturbed me, and the things that disturbed me were things that I consider very important, like what happens when you die, and what happened to yesterday, and all those silly things that kids ask that we as grown-ups, because we know better, don't ask. But those are really the important questions that should be asked and never are, not just by photographers, by everybody. Everybody should ask, what the hell's going on here? So you've used your camera as a journal in which you record intimate thoughts, self-reflection, and very often philosophical musings. The only thing anybody knows for sure is what they experience. If you look at a photograph of somebody crying, you register grief, but in fact, you don't know what those people are experiencing at all. You're always projecting on the world your version of what that emotion is. So the what is known is only what I know. The only truth I know is my own experience. I don't know what it means to be black. I don't know what it means to be a woman. I don't know what it means to be Cartier Bresson. So I have to f define my work in terms of my own truth, and that's what the journey is all about. If you are true to your own instincts, and the great, the great wonder is that each one of us, you know, has its own, we have our own validity, we have our own mysteries, and it's the sharing of those gifts that makes artists artists. Uh, and I had the attention span of a two-year-old, so I, I don't remember the question. 
I was asking why you were willing to limit yourself to the constructed experience oh, versus yeah. mm -hmm. the art that we find in the world that is so much uh, the uh, notion that engages so many photographers and critics yeah. currently. Well, actually, in, in photography, most photographers are, or the repertoire school of photography, up till now it's been pretty much of a no-no to do what I do. American photography has always dealt with going out and documenting reality or documenting some starving people or documenting the facade of a building, but it's very seldom dealt with the interior landscape. Social landscape was a very big number in the 50s, or I guess 60s, I don't remember anymore. But uh, my kind of photography has really been somewhat of a, a wolf in the hen house in the sense that uh, it's been, in America, it's been not that much accepted. It's now, it's accepted now, but I mean, it's a relatively new notion that one would sit down and think about something and then make it happen, rather than looking for it. But my truth, the interior truth, ultimately is the only truth. When you are developing a work, can you tell us whether the words, the plot, or the image comes first in your mind? Actually, it's the chicken or the egg. No, it really depends on the notion. Uh, most of all, I pay attention to my mind. We all have minds, and most people don't pay attention to their mind. Um, we're also distracted, incredibly distracted by the noise of the culture. I mean, you can't walk down the street or turn on a television. I mean, the whole culture is designed to distract you, and maybe that's why I'm attracted to Eastern religions, because it, that really deals with the more of an interior dialogue. So I really work totally out of, out of my mind and my imagination. Do you think of yourself as a short story writer? Yeah, yeah. I feel like Cal Burnett. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, yes, I do. Uh, I, oh, that's right. That was a good question, too. I don't believe in categories, and I think that if the key word is expression. And if I want to express myself with photographs and writing, that's terrific. I don't believe in any rules. And I, I, I think that the rule makers are the people we have to watch out for. So I love the idea. Like now I'm painting with photographs and it's like, it's, it's like discovering a muscle that you haven't used in 20 years. It's terrific. And in one talk, and I believe it was at Ohio State, you talked about the creative potential of mistakes. How does your own work incorporate the accidental? I would be very open to using whatever accidents occur. I think most photographers depend 100% on their accident. And if they don't find a wonderful accident, they're out of business because they walk around the street from a camera with a camera waiting for this incredible thing to happen. And uh, in my case, because my work is so structured, it doesn't leave that much room for, for that accident. But I love accidents. Has the unexpected happened when you work? And can you not tell as, us about an example? Yeah, I wish I could. Not as often as uh, not as often as I'm sure a number of other photographers have had wonderful accidents. I've had wonderful accidents get away. You made a reference to your interest in Eastern religion that I would think is very relevant to your work and the way that you work. Not only your conviction that the unknown and the unseen is more real than so-called reality, but the very premeditation of what you do. And I wonder if you would tell us if it is in any way linked to either your Catholic upbringing or your current more meditative commitment to Buddhism. Well, I always say that I'm a professional photographer and a dilettante mystic, and I would much prefer to be a professional mystic and a dilettante photographer, but there's still time. <laughs> Whatever, but I really, yeah, uh, I was brought up a Catholic, and I was a very heavy Catholic. I used to mea culpa all the time, and I finally um, outgrew it. I simply, I simply asked too many questions, and the answers I, that they were giving me didn't fit anymore. And I'm very much attracted to Eastern religions because they don't give you answers in that same sense. They really ask questions. And I think photographs should not give you answers. I think photographs should ask questions. Photographs should not tell me what I already know. Photographs should contradict me. I think you've suggested that a photograph was nothing but illusion. And not only that, you've also suggested that the only reality is light. Mm -hmm. Is what I'm thinking fair or accurate? Photographers are always describing the package very well, but they never talk about the content. They show me what a person looks like. They show me the what of things, but they don't show me the why or the how of things. 
You are not what you appear to be. I'm not. The, I'm just saying none of us are what we appear to be. Nothing is what it appears to be, but we're so used to this, we don't see it anymore. Photographers are always looking, but they don't really see anything. Probably one of your best known images is a photograph that was taken in 1975 called A Letter from My Father. Right. And even to the casual viewer, the photograph becomes a repository of painful memories. And obviously it has all sorts of private and very emotional meanings to you. Did you write the caption at the time the photograph was taken? Can you tell us anything about the genesis of that picture? Yeah, that's one of my favorite. It means a great deal to me. Um, my father died in 1975, and I had taken the photograph in 1960. It's a picture of my mother and my father and my brother. And um, it's actually a truth situation. I, when I left home at 17, my dad always said he was going to write me a letter, but he never did. And so I kept saying, well, when are you going to write the letter? And finally, when he retired, I kept saying, now you have all this time on your hands. You know, where's the letter? And um, he never did write it, but it became a big joke. We used to sort of joke about it. So I'm going to write it. And so when he died, that was my instant response to it, you know, to deal with it that way. The photograph by itself is one experience, but the photograph with the text is quite another experience. To the works of which photographers do you most respond? Is he among them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, actually, I'm not a. Um, I'm not inspired by photographers very much. I mean, most of the people I take from are really uh, writers or painters. Uh, I don't take that much from photographers. My favorite photographer, my two favorite photographers in the whole world are uh, Robert Frank, who I think is wonderful, absolutely wonderful. And I love Thomas Eakins. I think oh, Thomas Eakins, I, son, I don't like his portraits very much. I'm sorry, Tom, <laughs> the way it is, but I do like his, uh, his photographs. There's such a sense, I think, I think an important work always has the sense of the individual in it. And uh, you look at Paul Clay, you look at Atcha, you know that nobody else would have done that. That's what's so wonderful about it. There's the power in the artist's work. It's that sense of, of his vision, and, and you're moved by it. It's extraordinary. You used the phrase before that you like when your assumptions are upset. Is that yeah. correct? When I'm contradicted, or when every, the only way I've ever grown is when, when all of my definitions have been uh, contradicted. And there is a work, the work of a surrealist painter that from its very beginning, had that effect on you. Yeah. And of course, I'm talking about René Magritte. And I wonder if you could tell us about your experience in meeting with him and photographing him and what influence he has had on your own work. Well, I see, I have to work with photography and photography to make an illusion. You see, people believe photographs too. They don't believe paintings, which gives a, phot a photographer an enormous weapon because he can, it's a wonderful vehicle to contradict people's assumptions because if you do something in a photograph that doesn't happen in real life, the fact that it's a photograph is very disturbing. Uh, so I was always jealous of painters because they could really make people, uh, Magritte could have people raining out of the sky and I simply couldn't do that. And so I realized that if I could paint, then maybe I could have another, another thing I could do. And, um, so that's what's happening. I'm teaching myself how to paint after 30 years, and I find it scary as hell, but wonderful. Do you think of yourself as a surrealist? I don't really think of myself that way. Uh, I don't know. I don't know about anything about labels. Uh, I don't think of myself in those terms. I just think about the work. I just think about what I'm doing at the moment. That's what I think about most of all. But Magritte was a seminal influence on your yes. life. He had this wonderful head. I mean, he had a mind that was so extraordinary, and yet he lived, he lived like a banker. So when I went to his house, I was very disappointed. I wanted to see, I wanted him to live in a cave, you know. And I wanted fists coming out of the wall holding torches, you know, and that, that, that sort of thing. And, and here, he, here he lived in a very swell section of Brussels, and he had a maid and a crystal chandelier, and he, he dressed like a businessman. And we had lunch one day, and um, we were watching, uh, uh, Magritte's favorite TV program was Bonanza. And we were sitting at the dining room table, and the maid is serving us our soup, and it's myself, Magritte, Georgette, his wife, and a TV set was sitting where the fourth person should be sitting, and there's <laughs> Hoss or Horse or whatever talking French, and I'm having soup with Magritte watching, you know, well, you had to be there, but it was fun. Yeah. Your own life, like so much of your photography, uh, relies also on double exposure. Yes. 
Oh, oh no, let's talk about the double exposure in the photography too. Can we do that? Yes. <laughs> because, um, you see, I think if you have to put up with, the, with all the limitations of the camera, then you should, the photographer should use everything that the camera can do, and certainly one of them is blurring and double exposing. I find it's very useful because people in real life do not blur or double expose unless you're drunk. You come from a small town in Pennsylvania, McKeesport, Pennsylvania, from a Slovak family. Your name, Dwayne Michaels, certainly would not reveal that. But you yourself have created a Slovak working class alter ego called Stefan Mihal. Stefan. Excuse me, Stefan yeah. Mihal. I think that there are some people who find themselves, you know, at half past 68, going on 69, and don't even know that they're alive. Have no idea. The whole question of who's sitting in this chair talking right now? Where do these ideas come from? How did this occur? What combination of events made this happen? I think it's extraordinary, and I think that all of us have an alter ego. He's the person we never became. Think of, think of the total opposite of you. Um, in my case, it would be somebody who is, who loves football, who loves, oh, I like to drink beer, but that's not good, but who likes to drink too much beer, who's married and has seven kids, who works in a factory, uh, who still does this a lot. Um, the person who you are not, it's like matter and antimatter. If I should meet him on the street, we'd probably blow up. I mean, we're complete opposites. So where did you get your inner strength? I think I got it from a wonderful attitude of my mother and father, um, and that was, a, that was a belief in the possibilities of things. I had absolutely no reason, sitting in McKeesport, Pennsylvania, to believe that all the wonderful things that happened to me could have happened. But it was their attitude that, why not? Take a chance. What have you got to lose? You could do it. And, and that's, that is such a wonderful gift. There is another famous person, born only two years before you in that same town. Uh, it seems fortuitous, I mean in the accidental, maybe even in the lucky sense, who was descended from an immigrant steelworking family, and he too won a scholarship to Carnegie Tech, and he too became a rapid success. I wonder if you can tell us if, when you lived in McKeesport, or since you know or have known Andy Warhol. No, I didn't know Andy in McKeesport at all. And actually, when I uh, finally, when, I mean, when I was growing up, I think he had moved to Pittsburgh at that point, but he was originally from McKeesport. Uh, I met Andy when I came to New York. For some artists, the medium itself is the end. It seems to me that for you, the technique or the tool is not quite so essential to your vision. Well, the mind is essential to my vision. and. Um, uh, the technique follows. I mean, I assume you know how to, I, I assume that one can focus a camera, and if you can drive a car, you can take photographs. I mean, it doesn't take, there's no, the mystique of the camera is something that always amazes me because I think photographers tend to hide behind it. You know, the F64 and, um, you know, all the stuff. What kind of equipment do you use, or does it matter? Well, I use Nikons, and I wish they'd, you know, I just said that on television, they should give me some money or something. Uh, I use Nikons. I'm not an equipment nut. I think that you should know your equipment and forget about it. It's like, it's like uh, as if a group of writers, can, can you see, uh, could you see Joyce and Steinbeck and Hemingway all sitting around comparing typewriters? You know, you ought to see my Olivetti, my, I mean, you know, I mean, it's, uh, where do you see mine if it's electric, you know? Except in that instance, the message is not the medium. You still sustain yourself in many ways by work that you do for magazines, corporations, and the like. I love doing jobs. I really do. And whatever, whatever you do, it, it should be done well. So it's just as much pleasure for me to, uh, to do... Uh, you know, in a commercial assignment, as it is to do my own assignments. Uh, they're just for different reasons, but I really love it. And uh, I don't know. I don't want to. Do, I like to work about two days a week, actually. I don't want to do too much, but uh, I like to make enough money to live comfortably. But I will. I will always do commercial work because I don't want my private work to have the responsibility of supporting me. I want it to be free of that.
You mentioned earlier when I referred to the photograph, a letter from my father, yes. that it was among your favorites. Yes. It's an almost unfair question to ask, but I think I will. Are there any other, among all the thousands of images mm -hmm. that you've made, that have special meaning to you for one reason or the other? I like building my own pyramid in Egypt, which I thought was terrific. This one where I went out and I built in oh, view of the little pyramid, I built my own pyramid, uh, which seemed reasonable. Uh, With the layered yeah. rocks. Mm -hmm. Actually, my pyramid is bigger than their pyramid if you view it at the right angle. <laughs> it's <a> pyramid envy. <laughs> <laughs> Your work and your life is obviously concerned with spirituality yeah. on the one hand. On the other, I wonder if you could tell us if you are bothered about the business of photography. No. Uh, business, I mean, this, these are, it goes with the territory. This is called being alive in New York City in 1980. And uh, I keep the business end of it to a minimum. I don't consider myself a particularly aggressive person, yet I survive. Um, one of the big rules is the rich get rich and poor get poorer. And the same thing in photography, the more you get published, the more you get published. But nobody wants to make it happen. You've got to get the ball rolling. So I always encourage people, if you want something, for Christ's sake, go get it. Make it happen. And, uh, but it, it has a life of its own. Uh, but business I deal with, but it doesn't run my life. I live comfortably, and that's all I want. Do you limit the editions of your work? Do you only make single images, or do you not worry about how many impressions exist? No, I, 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 I limit the edition of photographs because I think that once photographers enter the print market, then you should adhere to the rules of the print market. And if I think somebody's going to, if I'm going to spend a lot of money for a photograph, I want to know damn well there aren't going to be 3,000 of those things floating around. So it's respecting the buyer as well as myself. My big, my big mistake was not making the edition big enough. I never dreamt I'd sell 25 of anything. Want to buy a picture? I do, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Some people suggest that the logical next step for your kind of serial imagery is to make the transition into film. Is that something that you have ever considered? Uh, no. I've made a little film with a friend of mine, and some other people made a film about the work, but I think if I thought I was spending more than $100 a day on something, I'd be hysterical. And I'm such a loner. I, I don't think I, I would have to write it, act in it, direct it, and film it. How I long does it take you to yeah. set up the sequences that you do? Well, most of the work is done in my head, so when it comes to the actual shooting time, it's very easy. I can do the whole thing in an hour. I'm very fast. Do you think that photography is art? Sometimes. And sometimes art is an art. That's the basic mistake of photographers, the whole notion that Without those rocks and trees and funny looking people standing on the corner eating carrots with American flags, they wouldn't have a picture to take. And they completely bypass this, inc this incredible thing that we are, the mind. The best part of us is not what we see, it's what we feel. We are what we feel, we're not what we look at. And when, when, and when these eyes close, it's all over. So we're not our eyeballs, we're our mind. People believe they're eyeballs and he's totally wrong. If he, what would he do if he, if he really had to just sit in a room and think of the kind of wonderful things he would create? Photography is the only field. All the other art forms are based on the imagination. Duane, do you have an internal audience, a set of benchmarks that you turn to? Um, no. I, I don't know what I turn to. Uh, obviously, I feed off of my own self. I'm, I'm very self-motivated. I do what I say I'm going to do. Um, Nobody has to sign me something. I create my own energy. I create my own enthusiasm. I guess now I have to ask you the inevitable question. What next? What do you be, expect to be doing next year, 10 yeah. years from now? I don't know. That's what's so exciting about it. I, I wouldn't limit myself to any possibilities, and I have no idea what I'll be doing next year. Probably more painting. I feel sorry for people who know exactly what they're going to be doing next year. The same thing they did five years ago. But how wonderful to have all your options, especially when you're older. When you're a kid, it doesn't make any difference. The whole world's sitting there, and you're 21 and oh boy. But to be 12, 48 and oh boy, that's a trick, and, and that's wonderful. What are you working on now? Well, it's the painted pieces and the drawings, um, which is wonderful because um, it's so difficult and scary, and I can make a total fool of myself. And uh, I think it's very important always to be living on the edge.
where it's always possible when you're not quite sure what this is about. That's the excitement, you know. When you first started to work, can you tell us something about your first shows, your first reviews, and how you responded to them? Well, there was a wonderful little gallery in New York that most people don't know about called the Underground Gallery that Norbert, Norbert Kleber ran for a long time in his cellar. Well, and his cellar was his apartment, so his apartment was half gallery, and, and he made no money. And he, he after Helen G., and the Limelight Gallery, which lasted for a brief period. Norbert was the only thing between oblivion and photography in New York. And it was a wonderful period. You know, if you sold something, it was like $15. And Norbert would paint the whole gallery. It was a wonderful time. And um, um, I got so excited about Norbert, I forgot what the question was. Your first shows and oh, your yeah. first so, shows. So I, I had a number of shows there. And the, the group of people that showed at that point, like Gary Winogrand uh, and myself and a number of others, uh, were that's the only place you could show outside of the modern. And it was a, a very exciting period. But the first show, I, when I showed sequential photography, most of the people walked out. Half the people left because it wasn't photography. And um, it wasn't reviewed. Um, the, the critic at the time asked me, what, 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 what was this? All during the course of our conversation, you have been very straightforward, in fact, even courageous in articulating your own personal ideas and preoccupations. And one of your central concerns is the whole notion of human awareness. I wonder if you would agree with that assessment and you'd, if you'd care to comment on it. Oh, absolutely. But if there's some way that we could understand that being alive is simply not a matter of consuming things and using, and using deodorants, it really is a matter of being a walking, talking, once-in-a-lifetime offer in the universe that's never going to appear again. I mean, all those wonderful combinations that made me and not Stefan, that came together that produced this instant, will never happen again. And this is only 30, maybe 60, 70, 80 years, which is nothing in time. And we don't even see it. We are so dead. You know, and, and somehow beyond photography, maybe I use the photography somehow to explain to myself, to remind me that I'm alive. Thank you, Dwayne Michaels, for being with us, and thank you for being part of today's program. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein for Visions and Images, American Photographers on Photography. Mm -hmm.